As you said, my name is Eli Halverson. I'm from SDSU. Um, I'm going to present to you uh, some of my master's work that I've done over the last two years. And my advisor is Dr. Christopher Osterloh. He's a professor of soil science at SD State in Brookings. And without further ado, let's get started. So here's an outline of everything I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about uh, a man named Joseph Hutton. Uh, I'm going to talk about some history of South Dakota, soil degradation in South Dakota my current study, and I'll talk about some of the results that I've found in that study and some of the, uh, the implications um, from, from that. So introduction as to who I am. So uh, once again, my name is Eli. Um, I'm a master's student at South Dakota State. I, I love soil. I consider myself a, 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 a a pedologist, more, more or less. So a pedologist is someone who, uh, not only are they a soil scientist, but they're someone who studies specifically uh, soil genesis, soil formation, um, land use, how do we tie in the story of how a soil is made and uh, how we tie that into to land use management. And um, pedology and soil health go, go hand in hand really well. So that's kind of where I, where I like to sit because I love soil health and I love... Uh, linking together how soils form and uh, how to manage them uh, in the best way. So, um, and then this is Dr. Joseph Hutton. So he was a, an, an SDSU professor of agronomy from 1911. I just realized I'm probably in your way. From 1911 to 1939, he was uh, one, of the, one of the real pioneers of soil health, especially in this state. He was super passionate, super vocal about uh, soil health and research. He conducted some of the first research in soil fertility and land management. He uh, helped and led some of the first soil survey efforts in South Dakota. So, um, you know, when you go onto web soil survey um, and you see all those soil maps for your land, that's all done by the NRCS. And uh, some of the first mapping efforts for that happened in the 1920s and Dr. Hutton was, was one of the first people to do it. And I'll talk more on that later. But uh, he was kind of an extension guy, and he did a lot of outreach events. He did speeches to producers and all over the state. He had a radio program, so he was podcasting about soil health before it was really cool. And um, he one thing that one thing that uh, this mic keeps slipping down. But uh, one thing that Hutton did, which I find really fascinating, is. He, uh, he documented a lot of stories and uh, communities of South Dakota and kind of the, uh, the hardships that they went through. Because if you notice, he was a professor from 1911 to 1939, so he saw a lot of the degradation that happened here. And that's, that's some of the stuff I'll talk about here. Um, so he was quite outspoken, and he was talking about things... Um, long before we even realized that uh, they were a problem. So this is what he said in, in 1937. So South Dakota has lost at least one third of its soil resources since the prairies were plowed and intensive grazing began. And he said that about half of that loss has occurred since he came to the school in, uh, in 1911. So he saw firsthand uh, through the Dust Bowl and just through teaching and the communities that he, that he lived in, uh, what 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 happens when you manage your soil poorly and he he said this and was outspoken not only at local levels but at federal levels as well so this is a letter to fdr also in 1937 pretty much saying the same thing so he really really cared about these communities and he wanted to make sure that um the stories of of the people of South Dakota were heard and that people knew that they had to manage their soil and had to put soil health first or else we had issues such as this. So um, uh, Tripp County, I believe that's West River. Um, uh, this is a choked out farm. A lot of people, when you think about the Dust Bowl, you think about states like Oklahoma and Kansas, uh, you know, the Panhandle and stuff like that, Nebraska. But South Dakota was actually hit really hard in the Dust Bowl. And uh, you'll see that in some of these pictures that I'm about to show. But so this is a completely choked out farm in 1935. Um, there's just nothing left. That is all just uh, dust that's probably been blown from maybe the neighboring farms or from miles away. That, that dust could be from, from Kansas for all we know. But uh, these are some pictures that I think are really moving. So this is in Beetle County. 
and uh, so East River. And these lines in the soil, like right here and right here, those are chisel marks. Um, the, the top soil had been completely removed, completely blown away. So this is 1935, um, about 100 years ago. And the, the A horizon, that top soil, has been completely, completely obliterated and, and moved to, to God knows where. And uh, here's a better picture of that. So just these big, deep chisel marks. So th this isn't even topsoil anymore. This is just complete subsoil. This is the top of your plow pan. Um, really moving stuff, and it's really when you when you drive by and you look at your look at your farm fields, it's hard to even visualize that some of the farm fields in, in South Dakota looked like this not not really long ago. And especially when you think on like the scale of soils, you know, on like a geologic time scale, thousands and thousands of years. This was 90 years ago. <laughs> like uh, we've we've really come a long way from there, but. Uh, Soils take thousands of years to form, and they can be lost in 20 years, just like this. So pretty crazy stuff. Um, here's a picture that he took. He liked to take pictures of people who were implementing soil health practices as opposed to people who weren't. Um, so here's a, uh, you can't see the field, but you have a choked out field here on, on, uh, on this side of the picture that's blowing dust into this field. But this is someone who is incorporating uh, um, a lot of ground cover, they were incorporating livestock, and all that choked out sediment just stopped right there. So that was something that he wanted to capture, and those are some of the stories that, that Hutton liked to tell with his, uh, with his photography. So here's another field with complete surface removal. Uh, this is all just exposed rock that was uh, placed here by the glaciers. Um, just absolutely nothing left. There's, there's really hardly any life left in, this, in that field choked out fence line. This was a common site. So all of these were taken kind of in, in the mid-1930s, kind of in the tail end of, that, of the Dust Bowl. Um, yeah, you don't, you don't see too much of this anymore. Uh, I chose this picture because uh, there's a pretty clear like flow path of water, um, just completely bare soil, some really uh, unhealthy looking, looking plants, looks like corn. Um, I like this picture because I'm pretty sure this is the SDSU campus that looks like one of the buildings on campus. I, I can't confirm or deny it, but yeah, isn't it? Yeah, so that's the barn on the SDSU campus. Um, I'm pretty sure there's houses here now, but uh, yeah, so this is Brookings about 100 years ago, and uh, yeah, just clear paths of water, and we saw pictures in, in some of the presentations that we saw. Like, you, you can still see rills like this on, on a lot of the farm fields, so um, History, history repeats itself. So uh, moving into some of the teachings that Hutton did. So here's some of the drawings that he did. So a worn out soil, so an unhealthy soil compared to a new soil with organic matter. So this is, uh, this is stuff that we still talk about today, right? And especially when it comes to, uh, these are hand drawn by Hutton, teachings that he did. Um, talking about the benefits of, of vegetation for stopping wind erosion or surface roughness to stop wind erosion. So this is 100 years ago, and he's sketching this by hand. And these are still soil health concepts that you'll probably still hear about at this conference and what you'll hear about at the soil health school and what you'll hear uh, a lot of your soil health specialists and conservationists talk about. And he was talking about it long before anybody really kind of, uh, before that was really on the forefront of a lot of people's minds. So. Um, kind of a pioneer in, in the soil health world, and it's cool that it was happening all in your state. But uh, I chose this picture uh, just because it's kind of fitting as to where we are. So this is from the Rapid City Journal, 1936, and where the farmer's looking for help now. So he's being flooded by politics and votes, but on the horizon is just more and more drought. Um, you know, we, we just heard the last speaker talk. Uh, I was in a four-year drought. We're in an election cycle. You know, History repeats itself, right? So uh, picture was taken in the Dust Bowl. This picture was taken in eastern South Dakota about a week before I moved here in May of 2022. Um, that's when that really nasty derecho came in. And I moved to Brookings, and I showed up, and there was all these down trees, and grain bins were caved in. And the house that I moved into was covered by splatter of mud. There's just brown splotches all over the house in, in town. And it was from that. So this, this storm picked up just dirt and sediment from God knows where. And uh, 
Yeah, if you if you uh, like cut out this part of the picture, put it in black and white, you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to tell that it was taken in uh, uh, 2022. You would think that it was taken in the 1930s. So history repeats itself. Uh, soil erosion. So this was written in uh, 2023, and um, so we're still talking about soil erosion. It's still a threat, you know. And when we when we think about soil erosion, we're not only losing nutrients. Uh, you know, we're polluting waterways, but we're losing a lot of carbon too. So when you're losing topsoil, think about the amount of carbon that's, that's held within that topsoil and how much can be lost across your farm fields. So Midwest may amount to 57 billion metric tons of topsoil over the past 150 years. That's a rough estimate, obviously. It's really hard to, to quantify that, but just uh, try to conceptualize that. So 15 billion metric tons. A dump truck holds what, like 14 tons of soil? So think about that, and that's just in the Midwest. So, um, you know, even for someone who studies and writes and reads about erosion every day, I still can't wrap my mind around, around those numbers. So soil loss, uh, everybody in this room probably knows, it's a severe threat to fertility ecosystem services. So when we're losing topsoil, we're not only harming the ability to, to grow crops, but we're harming the ecosystems that rely on other biomass that are, that's in the soil. So erosion alters properties not only on the surface, but it alters properties on the subsurface as well. So this is kind of where we think about things as a whole soil profile, you know, uh, pathologically. And uh, there, it has dramatic impacts all the way down to, to bedrock. So uh, billions of dollars in economic loss. And South Dakota soils, as I just showed you, they have a, a long history of degradation. South Dakota soils themselves are highly erosive, and there's a reason for that that I'll talk about. But uh, um, erosion on the Midwest, it often exceeds the rate of soil formation. So soils form very, very slowly. Like I said earlier, it's on a geologic time scale, and uh, Farming is not, so this was taken from a, a huge meta-analysis, so that's taking uh, information from just hundreds of studies. And uh, conventionally tilled soil, on average, you know, th this is a global average, about two millimeters per year, give or take, uh, is your erosion rate. Um, you know, there's a lot that goes into that that could change, you know, uh, accelerate that or decelerate that, but roughly two millimeters per year, and the average soil production is uh, 0 0.05 to 0 0.08. So given that, it's been estimated that about a third of the U.S., just the Corn Belt region alone, has lost their original A horizons. So through the Dust Bowl, through losing just a couple millimeters per year, if you take two millimeters, two millimeters per year and you average that out for 100 years, that's the loss of an entire soil horizon. That's like 20 centimeters of loss. So pretty crazy stuff. So how has South Dakota soils been impacted? I showed you some pictures of some pretty degraded soils, but um, as, as far as the status now, uh, that's, what, that's what my study looked at. So uh, we wanted to assess the land use driven changes in so soil properties. That should say erosional loss. This must be the, the, old, the old slides. But uh, uh, we do that by revisiting and resampling uh, initial soil survey description uh, locations in eastern South Dakota. Uh, and we, uh, with those revisited sites, we quantify soil loss within the century. And then I also have access to uh, long-term soil carbon data. So soil carbon data that goes back 100 years. Jesus. And, uh, and cultivated and, and pasture lands. As you can tell, I, I hate having things in my ear, so I'm like constantly fidgeting with it. But uh, so utilizing legacy soil data, um, we have initial soil survey descriptions from Moody County and, and Brookings County. Uh, this is all East River, South Dakota. So when I say soil survey descriptions, these are descriptions and this is soil information uh, that was collected when they were making the first soil map. So I mentioned earlier like web soil survey, you pull up a, a soil map of your land. Um, this was, uh, these are the descriptions used for those to make soil map units. So this is information that's collected primarily uh, by the NRCS now, but back in the 1920s, how I mentioned uh, Dr. Hutton, he helped with some of the first uh, soil surveys. So I have soil surveys from Dr. Hutton from 1926, and then I have some USDA Soil Conservation Service ones from 1955. So for those of you who don't know, 
The NRCS now uh, used to be the Soil Conservation Service, uh, and particularly in the 1950s. So I revisited those sites once again in 2023, and uh, so now we have a 97 and a 68 year comparison to look back to uh, what those soils used to look like compared to now. And then I have other data from Hutton from the 1920s looking at soil carbon. So we have total organic and inorganic carbon data um, from the 1920s. Those sites were revisited in the 1990s by uh, a now retired soil science professor by the name of Dr. Doug Malo. Some of you may know him. Uh, Dr. Malo revisited those sites with Dr. Tom Schumacher, another retired professor. And uh, they revisited those in 1996. So I went back to, uh, to those sites once again in 2023. So in soil carbon, I have 102, 75, and 27 year comparisons. Um, to track. So there's a lot of moving parts here, but I'll walk you all through it. And we have some pretty interesting results. So I'm really happy to share them with you. So to give you some background into Eastern South Dakota, I, uh, since I study pedology and soil formation, I'm going to nerd out on uh, geology for a little bit. So uh, this is Eastern South Dakota. These are all the soils and soil parent materials. Uh, Eastern South Dakota was glaciated. Where we are now, it was not. But uh, Back in the Pleistocene, so 10, 15,000 years ago was the last glacial uh, maximum. Uh, this whole area was covered by about a mile, mile and a half thick sheet of ice. And it's pretty hard to think about that. But that, that ice sheet um, came through, kind of carved out this uh, like James River Valley here. And that's what you see here. This big finger coming up, that's the Prairie Coteau. And that was, uh, that's still glacial sediments, but uh, uh, in the last glacial extent, the glacier came down and split here. One went this way, that's the James lobe. One went that way, that's the Des Moines lobe. And it left kind of this uplifted area known as the Coteau. And a uh, bunch of glacial meltwater went and retreated off of that. And so basically what we're left with is in Beetle County, where the carbon study took place, that's kind of in that glacial trough in the, in the James River Valley. And then my erosion study is up on the Coteau in Brookings and Moody County. And earlier when I said that South Dakota soils were highly erosive, what I mean is that on the Coteau, you have really, uh, this is the relief map, you have really, really hilly topography. Um, and then you have really silty soils too. So not only do we have LUS, so we have wind-blown silt kind of like all up in here, but then in other portions of the Coteau, you still have kind of silty glacial drift because it was all reworked by meltwater. So, yeah, so a really fancy way of saying that there's silty soils and it's hilly. So naturally, silty soils and you have hills, it's a pretty erosive landscape. So, um, yeah. Here's what some of the old soil descriptions look like. Um, the ones on the left are from Hutton in 1926. The ones on the right are the ones from 1955. Much different than... Uh, an NRCS description, what they would look like now, much different than what I would use or what a soil judger would use going out and describing a soil profile. But there is a, a lot of good information in here and some key clues that we can look back to as, uh, as kind of marker features within the soil to, to track changes. So what we did was we, we read these uh, soil descriptions, interpreted them, and we were able to find the location. So we relocated the sites using um, the legal descriptions and the field notes, you know, go to this quarter section of this quarter section of this quarter section, X amount of feet from this fence line, X amount of feet from there. Um, so you got, you got pretty close, but we wanted to make sure that we sampled the whole variability of the soils there. So what we did was we went out to the original site and we sampled on a sequence uh, called a topo sequence. So we sampled at every point uh, um, along the hill in a kind of a systematic way. To, to get the whole variability of the soils at that site so we weren't misrepresenting the soils of that field, uh, so to say. So we took large soil cores um, and smaller soil cores in between, 11 cores per site. So in total, I described for this portion of the study uh, 142 soil profiles, and we quantified erosion for, for all of those. So... so uh, when I, when I talked about like picking out some of the clues in these soil descriptions, this is what I'm talking about. So 
features in the subsoil. If you go out to your field and you measure just your topsoil every year, that's really not going to tell you a whole lot, especially if you've uh, if you're tilling it every year or because you're just you're homogenizing your plow layer every year. So your plow layer could remain roughly the same depth every year, but over 100 years, you know, you've still lost soil, but you've just been incorporating it. So um, using Using features in the subsoil, you're able to kind of track how that soil profile is actually truncating. So as soils are tilled, they're eroded, they're tilled again, and those subsoil features shift upward. Okay. Um, so features such as carbonates, depth of parent material. So if you have, um, you know, windblown loss on top of glacial till, so if you have silty materials over some like heavy clay, or if you have silty loss on top of glacial outwash, so on top of like sand and gravel, stuff like that. So you just calculate the difference between the two and you're able to kind of quantify if either that soil profile has been uh, uh, either er eroded or if soil has deposited on top of it. So this is what I'm talking about when I say soil carbonates, just so we're all on the same page. So it's these kind of white splotches here. They're very dominant in pretty much any South Dakota soil just because of our climate. It's uh, mainly driven by uh, climate, temperature, and precipitation. But uh, this is the Hudek, the state soil, and it has all those carbonates in there. And it's a pretty signature feature for the soils of our, of our area. So this is also, so this is calcium carbonate, also known as lime. And some of you may not know, but it's actually inorganic carbon. So when you look at like total carbon data, and if you see your total carbon spike up in your subsoil, that's what this is. So this is not organic carbon, this is inorganic, but that's why you kind of have to be careful when you're looking at like total carbon data, because uh, inorganic carbon shows up in, in total carbon. So yeah, so here's, a, uh, here's some real picture examples I have of this. So this is at Anthony Bly's farm. Uh, how many of you were at the soil health school? Okay, only, only a couple of you, but this is at Anthony Bly's farm. Uh, showing real-time erosion and deposition. So these soils were like maybe 200 feet from each other. You have uh, this slope here probably, you know, it's a slope, but it's not really that intense. Maybe what, 5%? No, that slope there is about 10. That's 10. Okay, so this is like 10% here. But this section, this where this soil is here, that slope's not that great. But um, anyway, so you have this soil here, and you have just that plow layer. That's all the topsoil that you have. It's been homogenized right there, boom, and then you have just straight subsoil. And right there, you have all your carbonates that have just shifted way up higher because you've incorporated so much subsoil and you've eroded so much topsoil um, from all the years. And then I put this red bar here. This is the soil down here in the lower part of the landscape, kind of in the swale area. And you have about 50 centimeters of soil that's just been deposited on top of that. Uh, over the course of many years. Now, this is a natural thing that can just happen uh, in any landscape. Pasture lands, you can have a lot of erosion too, but a lot of this was definitely due to just long-term cultivation. So you're making it look like a bad farm. <laughs> no, th this, this, this is before you bought it, right? <laughs> so I would say, uh, Eli, that on the left, that the carbonates were at the surface at one time. They probably were, yeah. Yep, yeah. They, yeah, so, so soil carbonates do naturally leach down with, with time. It, it's a pedogenic process. But uh, yeah, so that, that's, a, that's a common trend that you see in a lot of eroded soils, is those carbonates are now a lot higher. And that has pretty dramatic implications on, uh, on soil fertility as well. And I'll talk more about that later. But here's some examples from, from my work. Uh, they're not as pretty as real pictures. I generated this using a software, but uh, this yellow box is kind of a, this is around that subsoil feature. And this one specifically, this is, uh, this is all luss on top, on top of glacial outwash. So this was sand and gravel. And across that topo sequence, it's pretty variable, but you can see at every one of these soils, um, that feature is shifted upward. And this is a flat landscape because this is glacial, this is a glacial outwash plain. So it's really flat because it was just like a bunch of moving water. But even in a flat landscape, I believe this soil lost, you know, like eight centimeters, probably mostly just due to wind erosion or tillage movement down uh, over time. 
Um, here's another one. This was a more complex landscape. I believe this was also in, uh, in a lust landscape. But, so you have more erosional areas here, and you have some depositional areas along the topo sequence. And even in the depositional areas, that feature is lower than the erosional ones, but it's still higher than the original. So not only are you losing soil because it's up higher than what it was before, but you're, you're depositing at the same time. So you kind of have like interacting processes, but over time you still lost soil, if that makes sense. So you have more soil that's lost up here, more that's lost up here. Some is depositing here, but then the rest has just moved on elsewhere. So average numbers, the soil loss per site was actually really variable. Uh, some of that variability just could be because of uh, certain management practices. I don't know the full management history on a lot of these fields. I don't know the full context. Uh, one, of the soil, one of the sites actually gained soil on average, which I thought was interesting. That was one of the sites from 1926. So you tell me. It could have been a deposition from from uh, from the Dust Bowl, his neighbor's field may have blown, you know, 50 centimeters of soil over there. But the average soil loss from the 1926 to present was 18.6 centimeters, seven and a half inches, about 1.92 millimeters per year. 1955 to present, uh, it averaged out to about 2.1 millimeters per year. So that's kind of uh, that's kind of uh, right in there in that, in that area where if you look at a lot of uh, erosional studies, both globally and in the Midwest, those erosion rates are kind of right in there, right about average than what you'd expect. So, so that was interesting. But yeah, about uh, seven and a half inches to six inches of topsoil loss just within uh, 97 or 68 years. So quite a bit. And... Uh, you know, you can lose small amounts of topsoil per year, but if you're building organic matter, you may not lose as much topsoil. But, um, so, uh, mollusols, so to get kind of on another soil rant, um, mollusols are the dominant soils of, of our region. So these are soils that have formed for thousands of years under grassland ecosystems that once dominated the state before we plowed it. Um, so like this is a mollusol. And uh, the hudec, the state soil, it's a mollusol. And mollusols are high in fertility. They're high in organic matter. And just really nice, deep, thick topsoils. And those dip, uh, deep, thick topsoils are known as mollic epipedons. And um, for, to be a mollusol, you need a mollic epipedon. So you have to have real dark colors, down deep, high organic carbon, um, high in nutrients, and that's indicated by dark colors. So mollusols are crucial to the region. They're why we have such fertile lands. But uh, as indicated here, so dark mollic colors, uh, those, that nice dark color comes from long-term accumulation of organic matter. So these soils formed over thousands of years in grasslands to sequester carbon deep, deep, deep within rooting zones. And the mollic colors back in 1955, those dark colors were at about 46, a little over 46 centimeters on average. Now, in the soils that I described, they're at 36. So that's about 10 centimeters of, of mollic colors lost. So that's just topsoil, that's just carbon. So think about 10 centimeters of rich topsoil that is really high in nutrients. So think about the amount of carbon that could have been lost there, the amount of water holding capacity that could have been lost there. That's a lot, just in 68 years. So uh, this is the, the masses of soil loss. So the reason this looks a little wonky is uh, to, to calculate the mass of soil loss. Oh my god. Um, to calculate the mass of soil loss, you need bulk density. So the 1955 sites were just a little more dense. So uh, the masses of soil from 1926 to present, this is if you hold the erosion rates constant throughout the years. Most likely, there was a lot more loss back then compared to what's happening now. But um, about 12 tons per acre, these numbers are just, uh, just different units. But from 1926 to present, if you hold that constant, it's about 12 tons per acre per year. 1955 to present, it's about uh, 13 and a half tons per acre per year. So 
Are you guys familiar with T values on your lands? Uh, T values on all the map soils, the tolerable soil loss, it's about three to five tons per acre. So it's about. What? The tolerable soil loss. Uh, that would be the, the USDA. That, no, you're not don't shoot the messenger. That's <laughs> yeah. There are there are people at the conference that you could probably talk to about that. But anyway, so so where so where did the soil go? Right? Like, is it gone? Is it uh, where is it? So it's down the river. Yeah, it's down the Missouri. It's down the Mississippi. It's in local. It's in lakes. It's in the Gulf, yeah, it, it could be in your neighbor's field, it could be in your ditch, it could be later, you know, it could be transported elsewhere in your field. So the soil's not always lost, but uh, uh, per se, it's moved across your field, it's moved into your neighbor's ditch, so yeah. But a lot of it has moved. They had traces of soil from the Dust Bowl all the way over in New York, so yeah. So soil's all over the place, and uh, so, Long story short, soils in the area have undergone severe losses. So a century of ag production has really accelerated topsoil loss. And they've truncated the soil profile. So we're not only losing topsoil, but our actual active soil profile has shrunk. So, And then there's just a summary of the numbers. So, All right. I don't have much time, I guess. So if I start talking a little fast, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch gears a little bit, and I'm going to talk about soil organic carbon and the, kind of those 100-year changes in soil organic carbon. So soil carbon is dynamic. It changes with management. Um, a lot of modern assessments are limited to kind of short time scales because we didn't measure soil carbon that far back. So this project use, utilizes uh, unpublished historical data from Dr. Hutton from cultivated and uncultivated fields. Back then, they were probably native prairies, but in the 90s, it was pasture land, and then when I went back out there again, it was pasture land. So just for context, they're not like, you know, preserved prairies. Um, so we examine the effects of long-term ag management on, uh, on soil carbon. So I went out and I sampled these fields in roughly similar pattern. We didn't take as many samples for the carbon study because we were not tracking soil morphology, but in a pretty similar fashion. So here's what some of that unpublished data looks like. Um, had to get pretty good at uh, learning how to read cursive to do this project. Oops. But uh, yeah, so so uh, so here's here's some of the results. I'm just going to jump right into it. Um, 1920, 1921, organic carbon. So this is cultivated land. Uh, if you're colorblind, I'm sorry, but you have 1921, 96, and 23 at three depths. Um, and you see this pretty big steep drop. So you had a drop of like, I don't know why I'm using the pointer, but you had a drop of 26.3% uh, total of the organic carbon in that 70-something 70, 70 years. But what's happening in 2023? We've increased carbon throughout the entire soil profile. And this is in cultivated lands. So I think that's pretty cool. And uh, it's showing that even like deep down in the soil profile, it's, it's trending upward. So not only is carbon increasing in the surface, but it's increasing in the subsoil as well. So you can get dissolved organic carbon leaching down deep into the profile. So why do you think it's happening? I'll get to that. Hold your horses, Anthony. So, so this, is, this is also interesting. So this is an uncultivated land, and we see the same trend. So uncultivated land, we think of a pasture as like a, kind of a more native setting. Maybe not much is changing. but. Now, in general, it was higher organic carbon across the board compared to a cultivated land, but we still had that drop from the 90s, and then it's trending upward again. Weird, right? So it's not only cultivation that's messing with the carbon in these soils, it's happening in uncultivated lands too. Now, this could, all, this could be shifts in a climate, this could be shifts in biomass on these pasture lands, this could be shifting in grazing intensities, right? So. Yeah, more intensely grazed pasture land back in the 90s. Maybe it's not as intensely grazed now. And over time, you've been able to, to build up that carbon. But uh, it follows the same trends. So deep down, even deep down in the soil profile, we're, we're, we're gaining organic carbon, both in uncultivated and cultivated lands. So here it is, uh, side by side. You don't have to worry too much about the letters. That's more for my advisor to worry about, because these are statistical tests. Um, but we had a significant drop 
from the 20s to now. And this, so uncultivated lands, that's that gold color. Cultivated lands, that's that blue color. You had that significant drop down to here, and it's trending upward. And so th this is the same data that I just showed you, but I just like placed them next to each other now so you can kind of see what's, uh, what these numbers are looking like. And it, they're uh, pretty dramatic changes in the, in the topsoil, but when you get down here, it's, you know, they're sitting at about uh, roughly the same. So pretty interesting stuff. So this is inorganic carbon. So this ties into the uh, erosion piece. So inorganic carbon, if you look in kind of that middle section, so 15 to 50 centimeters, cultivated lands, that blue color, our inorganic carbon is higher, much higher across the board in our cultivated lands. Why? Yeah, so erosion, I just talked to you about how uh, carbonates in these cultivated lands because of erosion and soil profile truncation carbonates are shifting upward. I didn't study erosion in Beetle County, but yet these results here, lab results from inorganic carbon, just confirmed what I had already studied on the other side of uh, you know, two counties over. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, and then even down here, like even in the topsoil, you're getting uh, traces of carbonates up there. Now that could be from lime as well, from you know, placing lime on your fields. But yeah, so I just thought that was interesting. Here's the bulk density on these fields. So pretty, uh, pretty stagnant down here. And then as soon as you get above 50 centimeters, doot, 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 uh, that's in the cultivated land, a lot more dense. So um, pretty big differences above 50 centimeters in our bulk density, pretty much what you'd expect. So when you take your carbon and when you take your bulk density, you combine them, what do you get? You get carbon stocks. So that's the amount of carbon held, think of like a container like a Pringles can and you're shoving carbon in it, okay? That's like what a carbon stock is. So uh, when you take the bulk density and if you hold the bulk densities constant throughout the years, they probably have changed, but I just don't have that data. But if you hold those bulk densities the same throughout the years, you see the same trends. So you see the decrease from, from the 20s to the 90s and then they're starting to trend upward again. So yeah. So there, to summarize just that piece, organic carbon decreased significantly from the 1920s to the 90s. It's trending upward from the 90s to now. Bulk densities in cultivated lands a lot more dense. Uh, when you combine those, carbon stocks were a lot lower in cultivated lands. And uh, the carbon stocks decreased in the 75 years and they increased again up until now. I'm almost done. <laughs> so. Uh, to summarize, soil carbon, uh, it's changed a lot within the past century. Um, soils of Beetle County, I think I've uh, come up with enough evidence to say that the, uh, the soils in Beetle County have increased carbon in, in, the, in the past 27 years. Um, this is probably due to a lot of things. Um, it could be due to increased conservation practices. I don't have the numbers on Beetle County of how much has changed in the last 30 years. Um, as far as incorporation of different uh, cropping practices uh, or different tillage practices, uh, pasture practices, I don't know. That'd probably be a question for Kent Vlieger if you flag him down. Um, but uh, one thing that we should also take into consideration is um, increased yields and increased biomass. So since the 1930s, not only have we decreased our tillage, but we've increased our corn yields exponentially every year since the 30s. So when you're increasing corn yields, that's a pretty heavy carbon crop. So if you have more yields, you have more carbon just in the biomass itself. And if you have more practices, such as just leaving the residue on there, you just have simply more carbon going back into your system. So I think it's a mixture of not only decreased tillage, but it's increased yields and better genetics. And there could be some climatic influences in there too. So in the past 100 years, we're probably a little more moist, maybe a little warmer, you know, maybe more carbon is getting, uh, getting broken down at faster rates. Um, more CO2 in the atmosphere that can get sequestered. So yeah, there, there's a lot going on here. Uh, it's a very dynamic system and we can't really just pinpoint it at one thing. So, yep. I'll plug you guys with just one last thing before I'm done. So this is the Drowning in Dirt exhibit in Brookings at the South Dakota Agricultural Heritage Museum. 
If you've never been to the museum, I highly recommend it. It's really, really cool. There's a ton of cool stuff there. Uh, right now, there's an exhibit called the Drowning in Dirt exhibit. It's about pretty much the, uh, I gave you the abridged version of the Drowning in Dirt exhibit uh, about Joseph Hutton and the Dust Bowl. Uh, there's a lot more up right now at the museum. Um, yeah, that's up until August of this year, and then starting in probably the late fall, there's a, a huge, like, two or 3,000 square foot exhibit going up about just soil health and soil conservation in South Dakota. And that's all, um, you know, the Soil Health Coalition has, has uh, um, provided information for that. Uh, Anthony's provided information for that. Some of my work will be in that. And it's really great. It's going to be a, an exhibit talking about soil health, soil health practices, conservation in South Dakota, management practices, stuff you can do at home. Yeah, there's a lot going on. The NRCS has a large hand in it as well. Um, but it's going to be a huge exhibit. It's going to be family friendly, so you can bring anyone. There's going to be something there for everyone, and it'll be, it'll be really great. So I highly recommend taking a trip over to, to Brookings in the near future to check that out. So um, on, the, on that note, I'm going to thank you guys for, for listening to me today. Um, it was really cool to... Uh, to see how many people came to this talk. And it's really great to be at this conference. A lot of like-minded individuals all here for the, for the love of soil. So my email's up there if you want to email me. I'll be here for the rest of the conference if you have questions. And I don't know what time it is, but oh, OK. Um, yeah, so there's a whole list of acknowledgments there. Thank you to the NRCS, the Ag Heritage Museum, for providing the data, and uh, the NRCS staff for helping with landowners, and yeah. Thanks, guys. That's all I have. Thank you.